Hello and welcome to John Mike's Virtual Tours, live tour here of Edinburgh today, Monday, and uh, we are going to start off in what is called the extension to the first new town of Edinburgh, or second new town, and we're in Albany Street. But I'm just going to say something about our tours before I start guiding as such. Uh, we could always do with more people uh, subscribing to us on YouTube because uh, we only leave these videos on for less than a week and then they go on to YouTube. So if your friends are wanting to watch and miss them, then uh, subscribing to YouTube is a really good thing to do also. So I'll start guiding. Now I'm in front of uh, number 11, which was the home of one William Erskine, who was a really close friend of Sir Walter Scott, famous novelist of the late 18th, early 19th century. Uh, William Erskine, was a very likeable character. He was born in Newthall in Persia. He was the son of a clergyman and he went off to Glasgow to study law. And he became uh, an advocate, but he was also very talented as a songwriter and he was a very fluent German speaker. He uh, specialised in German and also a classical scholar. So exactly the sort of person that uh, Sir Walter Scott would uh, love to have as a friend. And so he did. And uh, William Erskine became a great uh, confidant, a very close friend of Scott, a great influencer, somebody who would look at uh, Scott's novels after they were completed to give him advice. And the only other close confidant was James Ballantyne, who was a publisher. And James Ballantyne also lived in this street here. This street was absolutely crammed full of architects, of great minds, of literary figures, of musicians. In fact, Felix Mendelssohn uh, spent some time here, and it was here where he wrote uh, the Scottish Symphony. Anyway, William Erskine, uh, he was uh, with Scott a lot uh, at his dinner parties down in Abbotsford, and as time went on, he became more and more respected as a great mind, as an advocate, as a legal genius. So he was elected uh, to the bench, which means he became a judge, and he was called Lord Kinnadar. All was going very well until a scandal engulfed him, a sex scandal where a prostitute, a very well-known prostitute, a lady of the town, a Mrs. Burke, it was said that he had had some sort of liaison uh, with her. Now, it's been found out latterly that perhaps that wasn't the case, but he was being used as a bit of a pawn in a conspiracy to set up somebody else, but it was bad enough for him to have his health affected by the scandal and it didn't take long before all sorts of nervous things happened to William and uh, he uh, died very suddenly in 1822, which was a huge shock uh, to Sir Walter Scott. And it was said because in 1822, Walter Scott was organising the visit of King George IV to Edinburgh. And it was said that um, he uh, plunged himself into the gaiety and spectacle of organising that visit with a great aching heart because he had lost his friend uh, during that year. So William Erskine, one of the rather unsung heroes of uh, Edinburgh's history. Now Albany Street uh, was feud in the early 19th century, meaning it was estate lands with open views over to the River Forth. And by feuing it meant that landowners began to take money from people who were building on their land and uh, these uh, builders and uh, occupiers would pay money called few duty uh, to uh, the landowners. So this was one of the first uh, residential streets of what we call the Northern Extension to Edinburgh's new town and uh, it's wonderful. Uh, it was one of the first streets where you've got uh, two storeys high, not so foreboding as George Street with its three storeys, more comfortable, more residential, large paned glass windows as well. As you can see, the amount of glass in this street was more than most other streets and of course most fitting that it was some of the wealthy and powerful people that stayed here. Called Albany Street, named after uh, Prince Frederick, who was also uh, Duke of Albany, who was the younger son of uh, King George IV. And we were very much involved in warring and conflict and uh, adulation to great war heroes at the time. So many streets in Edinburgh were named after Prince Frederick, and he was also Duke of Albany, and hence the name 
Albany Street. So we are going to just walk along. So we're going to cross the street here, which is called Dublin Street. And here again, of course, typical Edinburgh with its hills. It's hard work walking up into the middle of town from where I stay, but it's a breeze going back because it's all downhill. Now this uh, street called Dublin Street was previously called Duke Street. And I don't know if uh, Joel can capture this old sign just above where it says Dunn Park, uh, where it is actually Duke Street. And of course that ties in again with the Duke of Albany and Prince Frederick. And uh, this existed as that street up until 1966. And they decided to avoid confusion they would change it to Dublin Street because there was already a Duke Street in Edinburgh, or rather in Leith. So uh, we've only got one Duke Street that I know of today. So no more confusion for sale sign. Uh, this was an example of residential architecture designed by Robert Reed, and Robert Reed was master of works uh, to the crown, so he was engaged often by royalty but here in this case was some of his typical uh, Georgian architecture. He was very influenced by Robert Adam, who we talk about a, a bit more, very famous. But uh, Robert Reed tended to, although he built in what we call the neoclassical style, it tended to be a bit heavier and stronger and less delicate than what you would see in Robert Adam's buildings. Get another glimpse across here to the left hand side. Robert Reed is known for building West Register House in Charlotte Square, which was also known previous to that as uh, St George's Church. And he had a hand also in the Bank of Scotland building, which uh, we spoke about in an earlier tour. So you see these elegant balconies and uh, the fan lights, as we call it, above the doors there, because they looked a bit like ladies' fans. And of course, once again, uh, you would have to have a bit of money and position to be able to live in a bit of town like this, certainly going back to the 19th century. So we'll continue a little wander uphill here. Scottish National Portrait Gallery. Closed just now because of uh, Covid, but we're hoping it'll be opening fairly soon. This massive building uh, houses a great collection of portraiture. And it was the first uh, purpose-built gallery for portraiture. It was quite innovative and uh, it was really based on a collection of one of the nobility uh, who had a good collection of portraits and that was uh, David, 11th Earl of Buchan, who was connected with the Society of Antiquaries, decided that uh, he didn't want it to be too elitist. He wanted people, the general public, to have access to portraiture. So this idea of having a uh, gallery for that very reason uh, was great on the list. We had a great sponsor for this idea who was Thomas Carlyle, who was an essayist, who was a writer, who's known for his writing about the French Revolution. And he had great admiration for heroes, heroes in history. And indeed, there are lots of sculptures here uh, up and around the windows. Uh, depicting uh, monarchs and poets and statesmen uh, back into history. And if you were to look quite closely beside the main entrance, there are two major figures from Scottish history. Uh, on the left hand side is Sir William Wallace, who uh, it's connected with Graveheart, Braveheart, if you've seen the movie with Mel Gibson, uh, who fought the, the Battle of uh, Stirling Bridge, 1297. On the right hand side is King Robert the Bruce, who fought the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314. Now if you look away at the top, now there is a more modern sculpture because after a while, the sculptures which were quite exposed, like the one at the top, started to fall to bits through weathering. 
and uh, this one depicts Cleo, who was a muse and the daughter of Zeus. And that statue is an aluminium, would you believe, and it's designed by one of our uh, contemporary sculptors called Sandy Stoddart. So Cleo stands there at the apex of the, the building. Now the building is in what we call church gothic style of architecture. Uh, they ran out of money shortly after the idea and the plans were presented, but it took a great man, a great philanthropist, called John Ritchie Finlay to put up the money in finance and he was the owner, one of the owners of the Scotsman newspaper and that enabled this uh, great gallery to take shape as it is today. It's uh, quite unusual for Edinburgh, it's in red sandstone which is more associated with uh, Glasgow and the west of Scotland. If you look at the towers, uh, it's almost like a church. The architect was Robert Rowand Anderson, who uh, designed many churches in his time, so he was very much at home in uh, putting forward a design like this today. And it was opened in 1889 to great adulation. And I'm an artist, I'm a painter, and I just love going in here. Wonderful building. And your place, probably a lot of people who stay here don't know this or are not aware of it. Uh, if you were to look closely, the buildings go downhill uh, this uh, street in front of us. So, looking ahead of us, it's like what is in front is further in the distance than it actually is because the street is going downhill. So, it gives a sort of distorted perspective when you're thinking, oh, it's all straight along here. I'm going to draw your attention to this here uh, this uh, Genting Casino. Now this originally was St George's Chapel and it was uh, opened in the late 18th century. It was Episcopalian uh, chapel because around that time people were able to worship in the Episcopalian manner. And it's octagonal. Not the original frontage. In fact what I'm going to do is to show you a picture of the original original frontage. I've got to watch, I've got to get run over by a tram. Joe is uh, waving me over here. <laughs> but such is doing these live tours. So here it is with the original frontage, which is a bit more decorative than what you can see today. Surprisingly enough, you never believe this, it has got a basement and in the basement is a wine cellar because they were very clever. They uh, got together with one of the local wine merchants and uh, they were able to store their liquor in the cellar of the church. So there you go. Okay. <laughs> um, St George's Chapel it was and that frontage today uh, dates from the 1930s. Uh, it was a showroom, okay, like a shop. But if you look carefully, you can see the octagonal shape of the tower behind. And if you look to the left, this was designed by James Adam, who was the brother uh, of Robert Adam. Robert Adam had three brothers, and James was one of them. And it was unusual for one of these Adam people to build in the Gothic style of architecture, but if you look at the manse on the left hand side, that's in church gothic style next to the more classical style which they were well known for. It wasn't a very popular building uh, in its own time, so maybe that's the reason it has gone to be a casino. Further along the street are some of the original gas lamps and you can see the kind of elegant kind of twirly ironwork here, but the less twirly it is, the older it is, because as time went on in the 19th century, they were able to get more decorative, whereas some of the older lamps were a bit simpler than this, and some of the older ones are in existence along here. And I think I'm going to be able to show you 
Uh, it was as far back as the 17th century when oil lighting was around Edinburgh and uh, oil, whale oil, they would burn. I can show you this one here. It's in a wee bit of a state, but this was the older, it was the kind of early 19th century, um, not quite as uh, modern as the other ones we saw here. It was not the case that these lamps were positioned on iron fences. They were attached to buildings originally when they were oil lamps. And with the advent of gas, they were positioned at the side of the street, on the side of the pavement. They were not positioned right beside your door, but they were positioned in wooden blocks, which didn't look great. So they thought to make this place look a bit finer, then let's put these lamps on the fences as they are today. So this is an older one, as it's simpler, okay? Now this person is a great hero of mine, because I'm a painter in oils, and it was the studio house of Sir Henry Rayburn. Now Henry Rayburn, a famous son of Edinburgh, born in Stockbridge, he went to George Heriot's school, did not attend art college, he was self-taught, he started off as a silversmith and then he started painting miniatures and uh, very successful he was at that and then as time went on he gravitated to larger portrait paintings what we call bust size where you would have the head and shoulders and beyond that he got to full figure paintings and then beyond that to figures in landscape and he is one of if not the most important Scottish painter, he travelled to Rome and he met Sir Joshua Reynolds. Sir Joshua Reynolds liked Rayburn and gave him some letters of introduction to hand around when he got to Rome. And uh, Rayburn returned to Edinburgh. He was well known internationally as well as in London. Surprisingly too, because he never left Scotland. He okay, went to Rome but he painted continually here in Scotland. So I have huge admiration for him. And it was because of his personality as well, he was able to paint the rich and famous people. He had a broad treatment in his painting. And I can show you an example of his work here, which is a self-portrait. I love this pose, actually. I'm thinking about doing a self-portrait, and I think I might adopt this pose. <laughs> As you can see, it's very kind of, it's a bit of Rembrandtish with the colour and light, but very striking. This is a man who commanded great fame and also uh, quite expensive. You had to pay him quite a lot of money if you wanted your portrait painted. He had a broad approach. He painted from life. He did not want to paint from sketches with the likes of uh, Gainsborough and people like that who had a more highly finished, almost artificial look in the people. These are alive. And he was made uh, painter and limner to the king. Uh, he was Scotland's national painter to the king. No small honour was that. And he was also made a knight in around about 1822. So Sir Henry Rayburn, as his fame improved, he purchased this amazing, in fact he had a hand in having it built, studio house with its enormous windows and you can see his dates and also the paint palette commemorating him here.